Hello. Um, hi, and welcome to the production uh, strategies for foreign animal disease and health. Um, today, uh, we would like to um, introduce Dr. Pete Thomas. Uh, Pete Thomas is the director of uh, veterinary science uh, for Iowa Select Farms. Pete is a member of American Association of Swine Veterinarians and has served on his program planning committee, budget committee, and pharmaceutical issues committee. He has attended the National Pork Producer Council's Pork Leadership Institute and has certified Pork Quality Assurance Plus Advisor through the National Pork Board. Pete graduated from Iowa State University College of Med Veterinary Medicine with a Master's of Science degree in, pre in Preventative Medicine with a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree. Let us welcome uh, Pete. Can you guys hear me okay with this mic? Maybe I'll just sound like that other one was working, so. Is that better? Okay, um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is a uh, foreign animal disease response plan for the first 72 hours after an outbreak in the US. And so um, talk about a little bit of how, what we've done to prepare at Iowa Select Farms and some of the considerations that we've thought about, maybe that'll um, help others identify some things in their systems or their operations uh, that, that they need to do to be prepared. And then also talk a little bit about a couple exercises that we've done. This is our geography, and so um, for you guys who may or may not be familiar with Iowa Select Farms, we've got 242,000 sows, and then we finish all of our uh, pigs raised on those sow farms. We've got one sow farm you can see out, out in that little tiny state of Nebraska over there. But otherwise, all of our production is in the state of Iowa, so we've got 2,400 sows out in Nebraska, and the rest of all of our gilts our sows and our finishing pigs would all be raised in Iowa. So when you think about the, the counties that are shaded uh, there on the map, those are the counties that we have farms in. Um, and then the uh, sows or the pigs, you can see those are the bigger the pig, the more sows we have in that area. And so you can see our, our footprint is a pretty swine dense part of the, probably the most or some of the most swine dense parts of the United States of America. And so. When you think about foreign animal disease and the risk to us, you know, we consider it to be a big risk. If, uh, if there was a disease, uh, foreign animal disease in the U.S., the most likely place uh, it would end up would be in Iowa. And also, if, if, uh, if it's in Iowa, we're the biggest producer in the state, and so we have a lot of risk in terms of getting a facility potentially infected and uh, risk to our system. So we've put a fair amount of work into preparedness, uh, trying to be ready for, for the disease. And so some of the considerations for the first 72 hours, I would say number one is have a plan for communication and have that written out. Uh, when you're in the heat of the moment, it's very difficult to remember all the things they feel like you need to do and it's easy to mix, miss one important uh, thing. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. Number two is have a plan for setting up a foreign animal uh, disease com command center. And so have a place where you know the go-to people are gonna be together and they're gonna be able to answer questions um, talk through things um, and have their phones and computers set up um, where, where, the go where people know where they can find them and where the go-to people are at. Um, the other one is uh, plan to identify any, any disease in your system. So in this case, African swine fever, um, prioritize what are the high, the, if there is foreign animal disease introduction in, into, the, into the U.S. or into your state where you operate, try to identify your sites with high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Identify those as quickly as you possibly can. Um, so you can do those epi epidemiological tracebacks and then getting the testing done um, in your operation to prove a site is either negative or uh, infected. Making sure that you're prepared to get your permitting done through uh, whatever platform your state uses in Iowa. We use EMERS for permitting. And, you know, you could spend a day just trying to figure out how to get into that thing logged in and set up. And so having some, making sure you have access and uh, knowledge of how to use it is important ahead of time. And then also all the, all the farms in your system that may not be uh, impacted at the time or infected at the time have plans for things you may need to do in a stop movement. And that might be the first 72 hours, and it might be longer if you haven't been able to prove to the state that those herds are negative. And so things like holding wean pigs, hitting breed targets, um, and et cetera, in your sow farms. 
And so really the big goals are identify any disease that you may have, protect the rest of your system, and then maintain business continuity. Um, some of the things that we've done ahead of time, so I'll talk a little bit about some things that we do to educate um, and set, set things up ahead of time to be ready for that first 72 hours. And one is just training for the employees and communication. And so uh, one of those is what we would call best practice. And our health service department will put out a best practice once a week. Uh, this would be on Af uh, African swine fever and foreign animal disease. And so recognition of clinical signs, um, those types of things, uh, what we would do in response. And then the, the one on the right is just a little blurb, an update on what's going on with African swine fever that'd be in our, one, of our, one of our weekly newsletters. So just try to keep that in front of people and keep that training uh, routine because if you don't see a foreign animal disease, you'll forget about it. Uh, you know, so if we can continue to train once or twice a year, uh, give updates, things like that, it keeps it fresh. Um, and then also we've got uh, some things for our, uh, our staff that work on our farms. Um, so it would be trigger points to recognize the disease. And so if we see certain things, we've got a document uh, that we share and we share in those trainings um, to report to the health services. So really what we want to do is identify something early and have a timely investigation into what's going on. And so in that document, we've got triggers for things like finishing mortality, uh, when you need to make sure you call. Uh, of course, if you see any clinical sign that looks suspicious, like a blister or something like that, you would call immediately. But some thresholds for mortality, some thresholds for abortions or mortality in the South Farms, and then what to do if you see those signs. So right away, call health services, um, and then health services uh, determines if that sounds like um, potentially a foreign animal disease potential, and then uh, what we would do in response uh, for collecting samples when we go out and, and identify that. So we've got some plans in place already and some things that we communicate on to our employees. And then also think about your plan for that initial communication. And so like I talked about before, I think it's important for an operation of any size to have uh, a, a good plan ahead of time. So who are you going to call? Uh, who needs to be in the loop? Who needs to uh, take this particular part of it and run with it? And so things like the disease outbreak response, who's going to be in charge of that? Who's going to be going to the farm to do the disease investigation? Uh, who's going to be doing the epi, epi work uh, for any potential sites, determining what sites would be connected and high risk because they're connected to that site through some way? And then how are they going to continue to um, find all that information and report it to the state? Uh, identify those high risk sites and do the appropriate diagnostics uh, to prove that they're either negative or determine if they're infected and report that to the state and be able to um, get them off quarantine and also uh, plan on, on the infected site who's going to be doing the things for disease containment, animal euthanasia, carcass disposal and so if you wait until the day that you're uh, called and have a confirmed positive case you're going to be really uh, behind already and so being ready on all those things, who are the contact people, who need to, um, who, who needs to be called right away. And then also uh, coordination with all the other premises. So you're really going to need all hands on deck. Uh, we did um, an exercise in 2019 with our system where we kind of had a mock that we had a positive south arm and it like took so many people and so, much, so many resources. Um, and so you're, you're really going to need just about um, everybody, whether it's even somebody on the south farm, a manager that's completely um, away from that area to determine what are they going to do when the state puts a 72-hour stop movement. And in our case, and that we, they didn't feel like uh, with the information we could provide, the amount of resources that, that they had even to go through those resources and determine which was all high risk, our whole system was placed on a quarantine. And so what are you going to do de developing those plans for how you're going to hold pigs, continue to hit uh, breed targets? Um, how you're going to wean sows to do that. Um, maybe can you or can you not get semen into the farm. Um, maybe you can or can't get the feed or limited amounts of feed into the farm. And so all those types of things need to be part of that. And then the last thing kind of from a, uh, preparing ahead of time for the first 72 hours is to have um, your enhanced biosecurity plans or uh, in this case the secure pork supply plans. I know every state's different in terms of what exactly they require. Um, we don't know 100% um, what we may need in the state. but um, we're, we're prepared to be able to set up our sites with a secure pork supply plant. We think that would uh, for sure at least hit the bare minimum. Um, we, what we did is, all you can see this is like the, gener the gener uh, generic document. And so we took all the variables in that document, uh, things like in this example, the first couple pages would be like the name of the site, 
the contact person, their phone numbers, the supervisors, and the veterinarians. Those things are all going to change. If you know, if you get 800 sites, by the time you get done with site number 800, the first 300 you did probably already have some different differences in terms of people associated with those sites. And then also different things about what type of mortality removal different types of sites might have, uh, as an example. And so we've got some if then statements, and we've got a master document uh, that we call our master site list. And so um, we've got basically any variable in a secure pork supply plan can be updated real time by clicking on it. And so um, all these things that highlighted would just be generated the day of you making that plan. So something maybe to consider. Of course, we've got resources that I always select with like uh, IT, people who do programming and things like that, which a lot of producers may uh, most likely wouldn't have for smaller producers. But there's also a lot of different um, companies working on a lot of different technologies when it comes to records and foreign animal disease um, biosecurity tracebacks. And so something, I think there's other resources out there, but something to look into or develop if you do have those resources. And then this would be a site map. And so um, all of our site maps would be drawn. And then they would be uh, uploaded kind of as the last page to that document. And so those are all ready and prepared. Um, uh, so we could literally hit a button and get those on a moment's notice when we needed them for whatever sites we needed them for. And so I talked a little bit about that 2019 exercise. And one thing, um, like I talked about having a communication plan ahead of time, um, one thing that I'll say in our case, which you look back and go, that was a pretty obvious oversight. But so we, uh, we are in our situation, we, one of, the, one of the, ex the sites for this exercise of the 14 states was our south arm. And um, when we did all the tracebacks, you're thinking about what's touched that site. Where did those, ant where did those wean pigs go? Where did the coal sows go? Some things like that. One real obvious thing is, you know, their last guilt entry into that farm was a pretty high risk for a potential disease entry point. And in all the, uh, you know, kind of mad scramble, completely forgot about identifying that site where those guilts had come from. So if you had all those things ahead of time, communications checklist, I think you would, you would not overlook any of those. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to talk about really for the rest of the presentation is some things with an exercise we did last fall. So what came out of that first one is, uh, two things. Number one, um, uh, how are we going to keep our business going the first 72 hours? So how are we going to be able to get all the information to the state to where they feel comfortable telling us which sites um, should be under quarantine and which sites we can, can be released from quarantine? And really when that boils down to is being able to get all the information to the state in a very clear format where they can look at it and they're not having to sift through a bunch of paperwork because you've provided all the biosecurity, all the potential risk points, um, and um, identified those sites already so they're not having to find them for you. And then the last thing will be uh, setting up the enhanced biosecurity uh, plan at a site. And so uh, what we did is we picked a finishing site in our system as kind of our site that was positive for ASF. And so this was a site that was actually marketing, did that on purpose in a high dense area, but it had been marketing at the time of the outbreak located in central Iowa. Um, and so we did all the, computed, completed all the contract tracing for that site and then also uh, set up the enhanced biosecurity site at a sow farm that was about a mile southeast of this, of this farm. Uh, we had um, the state of Iowa helped uh, coordinate on, the, on our epi contact traceback so we could get some feedback from them on what we were providing and what they needed and how many sites would be quarantined. And then um, Iowa State, uh, the SMEC, uh, some students and staff from SMEC came and helped um, and gave some insights on setting up the enhanced biosecurity plan. So we felt like we had some good partners to bounce things off of and feel like we were in good shape when we got done. Um, and so again, this is a pretty hog dense area in Hardin County. Uh, you can see this is the finishing site that was infected. This is a, a sow farm here. And then all the other sites uh, that you can see where there's a little pig, those would be all sites within our production system that would be located within five kilometers. Um, so when it, when it comes to the epi, we needed to determine where the infection may have come from and then determine any risky links with other sites that may have spread from this premises to other premises. And again, um, really we have to identify those things. It seems pretty simple, but when you start going through the list of all the things that have contacted your sites, um, it's a huge, it's a big list. So anything from like propane delivery, mowing, garbage pickup, there's a lot of things that touch your sites. And so um, being prepared to get all that information as quickly as possible is one of the most important things 
uh, for business continuity because the quicker you can prove uh, to the state where all your contacts with other sites are and they feel comfortable with that and the biosecurity involved with that, the quicker they'll release other sites from quarantine. Uh, the longer it takes you to get that information and the more they have to sit, sift through that information and come up with all the sites on their own, the, more, the longer they're going to keep your entire um, production system or, or farm in quarantine. And so you really need to um, demonstrate that lack of risk on sites. And so uh, what we had done after that first exercise in um, September of 2019 and recognize that as a bottleneck is developed a query where we can run a report um, of anything that touches our sites. And so it'll look at GPS data, any GPS pings, work tickets, site visit reports, site logins, uh, contractor services, anything that would be listed in our system um, would be uh, in that report. Now that's not completely comprehensive to everything, but it captures a pretty good amount of information pretty quickly. And then there's some things that require more manual follow-up. And so, for example, uh, the rendering route, um, we would have to contact the rendering company to get that information. Um, some of the things, so the state of Iowa has uh, listed for their contract tracing high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And so I think uh, the critical things to think about are focus on the high risk items first. That's what they want to see first and foremost, and that's what they're going to focus on, has been their feedback. And then the medium risk and low risk. And so what they have listed for high risk uh, things would be animal entries and exits. So any animals that have come or left that premises. Any entry of animal products, so in a case of swine, that'd be semen. Um, any mortality collection, so a rendering route, any contacts that way. Regular employees that may be on that site and going or coming uh, from and to other sites and then any history of international travel that may be associated with that site or other sites that you're trying to clear. And so as an example, um, this is kind of the report that we'd put together for the state. And you can see there's all the different things along the bottom, but this would be our mortality removal. And so we identified within the period of time they wanted these uh, mortality pickups from that site. So these would be all the times that Darling was at our site. And then we've got listed what they do from a biosecurity standpoint with their trucks their drivers, their trucks, what kind of downtime they may have when they're washed, um, that sort of thing. And then this would be, this site was marketing, so this would be just an example of some, a report that would be run that we would have in that same document that would go to the state with uh, market loads. And so you can see there's two market loads at the top that would have went out of that site, and then we can query uh, very quickly um, anything in a time frame that for trucks, trailers, and drivers. Uh, so the truck and trailer and driver for those two, uh, we could f identify all those loads, um, whatever time frame they would need uh, before and after uh, we, we took those market loads. So again, two of the high risk things, animals out, contact uh, with the trucks and dra trailers and drivers with those animals that had went out while they were likely infected, and then also um, the rendering. So a couple high risk examples of uh, pulling data on the high risk items. Um, and then we've got a a full list, and this is just a handful, just an example where we've got a call tree. And so uh, there's probably 30 things on this list, and we have a plan to split that list up by whoever site that is. If it's identified um, as a potential uh, quarantine site or infected site, uh, we would have a calling list, and people, we have a couple people would split that up. They'd call the first person, and then they'd call, uh, if they didn't get a hold of them, they'd text them and email them, then call the second person and just work their way down the list. Um, of course, that's a pretty limited number of sites right away, um, but it helps collect, make sure we don't have any gaps um, for, or for those things where we don't have that data captured electronically. And so when we did that contract tracing at that site, uh, we were able to get most of that information all collected in that document in the first morning, but there was a couple things that were tougher to get. So items that we don't have records for, like the rendering route, and then also um, loadout crews. So that site would have had contract loadout crews loading out pigs. And so now we got to try to get a hold of them and who was on that crew and where else did they go. And you're really reliant on their records. So I think working with any partners you have, because if you can't get that information, they might keep your whole system under quarantine until you've been able to test your entire system if you don't know where the loadout crew went after they're at your infected premise. And so in this case, uh, we had just kind of by the numbers, we had 40 sites uh, in our system that were deemed to be, to have risk, and we would have under quarantine, and we would have to go test and prove they're negative. Now, the good news is the other 750 or so sites 
uh, we would have been able to likely release from quarantine and be able to move forward uh, with those sites. And so on these sites, uh, some of the big numbers is the rendering truck, there were 17 sites that were considered high risk because the rendering truck had went there either before or after that site in the same day during that time period. And then also that would have also quarantined 22 sites outside of our production system. And so when you think about what is the big risk in terms of getting sites quarantined and uh, things that we need to get a better handle on as our system would be the rendering routes um, because they're high risk point, touch point and we don't have a lot of information about where they come and where they go and they also uh, touch a lot of different companies. And so it's part of the nature of that job obviously, but um, something that we need to consider probably to improve on in terms of getting that data and the transparency around that quickly. Um, site, common site manager, there was three additional sites quarantined. There was four uh, due to shared market truck with no wash afterwards. Uh, we had, again, 17 on the rendering route, 11 sites within five kilometers. We had 13 different visitors, or 13 sites that were quarantined because visitors had been at that site and then to other sites within 24 hours. And again, that was mostly due to the loadout crew and marking uh, marking pigs for uh, graded loads there. Uh, we had eight due to feed truck with no wash, wash afterwards and eight sites due to uh, mowing at the site with no wash afterwards. And so you can see that added up pretty quickly. Some of those had multiple touch points, but there's a total of 40 in our system that were placed under quarantine. Now, like I said, I don't know outside of our system. I know just from the rendering alone, we identified 22 additional sites and there may have been more from feed trucks and um, and uh, other sites within five kilometers. Um, I'll switch a little bit now and talk about our enhanced biosecurity plan setup. And so um, this is an example of our trailer that we have. It's our foreign animal disease response trailer. It's actually a lot more full now than what it was then um, when we realized how many sites we would probably have uh, under quarantine or in a control zone that we'd have to permit for. But um, what we really want to try to do is be able to secure the perimeter, uh, be able to clean and disinfect uh, traffic onto that site, onto those sites. Um, be able to set up for internal uh, site biosecurity and then segregating anything from the outside uh, traffic around that site from the people working inside that site. Um, so just a couple pictures of some key points where we set up. There's a couple posts with chain and a lock that go across the driveway here. So we've got some postal diggers um, and uh, we've got an auger in there now because I think the ground was already starting to get hard by late October on, in, on this particular day. Those posts aren't in there very deep. And then uh, uh, we've got some things, some power washers, and we've got some generators. We've also got some long extension cords, hoses to be able to set up, um, some electric power washers, disinfectant, um, sprayers at the sites. Um, and then uh, every site's a little different, but plans to try to contain the wash water as well. Um, this would be a uh, loadout where the coals go out and the sows come in. And so that would be um, an example of where we'd have that uh, staked off as a perimeter buffer, um, perimeter buffer area access point. So nobody would be allowed from the outside inside that point until you're ready to load out. And then you'd um, remove that black cord that goes across there. And then you can see this is the door entry into the site as well. And then you can start to see that yellow cord and that'd be the perimeter buffer area where there's no access inside that area outside of just those designated spots with the black rope. Just another example where the wean pigs go out. Um, and then kind of around the feed bins as well. It's hard to see, but there's yellow rope basically around the perimeter of this entire site with some black rope where entry can occur. And that's all based off the maps. Um, and so uh, that's kind of how we've been prepared. We've got all those materials already in a trailer ready to go. So we can go out and get about 10 sites set up pretty quickly without having to go buy supplies. Um, and just some other things to think about if you have a positive, some other plans. Number one, uh, plan to be able to hold animals during a stop movement event. Like you really don't know, you know, you say 72 hours, I can probably manage holding off weans depending on the farm and things. But if it turns into 10 or 14 days, how are you going to have a wean schedule to hit your breed targets? Where are you going to hold those pigs at? How are you going to feed them? Um, if you can't get feed trucks into your site or get a very limited amount, how are you going to ration that feed? Um, semen, depending on where your boar stud's at. It may be in a control area. Um, you may not be able to get semen, so how are you going to have a breed plan to try to continue to breed um, and do the best you can with conception rates? So there's a lot of things to think about uh, when it comes to holding animals, especially on a sow farm. Of course, holding on double stock a little longer or market hogs isn't, isn't uh, 
the end of the world for a short period of time. Um, but South Farms, there's obviously a lot more moving parts needed to keep business going on both ends, that end and then the end four or five months down the road. Um, and then plans to shut down and minimize all movement between sites. And so we really want to stop any movement between our sites because the more people are moving and things are moving during that 72 hours, the more chances there's going to be additional sites quarantined in your system. And so the best thing you can do is to stop um, anybody moving as much as possible that's not necessary between sites. Um, plans to complete the diagnostic testing. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this here uh, upcoming, but that's important. You know, you got 40 sites you need to get diagnostics collected from, maybe more, um, certainly in some circumstances. And then being able to get all those permitted movements done. Um, so testing of the quarantine sites, um, number one, we got to be able to maintain the biosecurity. So if we go to a site that's high risk, we don't track something into another site and just continue to add to the number of sites that are epidemiological problems. And of course, if you got 40 sites, you're going to have to have a lot of different people able to collect those samples. And so I think one thing to take advantage of is the USC has a certified uh, swine sample collector training. And so you can get certified, like I'd be certified to train uh, non-veterinarians to be an extension of the USDA to collect those samples. And so you have to go through a cert, I can, if you get certified as a trainer, then you can certify other people um, or, or a veterinarian that you work with may be able to certify you uh, to be uh, certified to collect the samples needed. So things like oral fluids, whole blood, um, spleens, those types of things are all part of that uh, training. And so you can have a lot of different people in different parts of your where you operate trained. Um, one thing I would say is make sure you have some materials on hand. So I did uh, Monday when I was in the office, I looked at my purple top tubes because I hadn't looked at them since 2019 and they expired a year ago. So I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have to give this talk. But anyway, so um, make sure you got all the things you would need to take those samples. Just having those things on hand, especially when you think about um, in the case of a foreign animal disease outbreak, it's going to be like everybody's scrambling to get the same stuff, right? And so having as much of stuff on hand as you can that makes sense ahead of time would be great. And the permitting. Um, like I said, it might take you at least a day just to figure out how to log into this thing, get your credentials figured out, um, figure out exactly how to do these permits, what kind of affidavits need to be signed and uploaded for these. Um, a day would probably be, you could probably easily spend a full day, maybe two, depending on how um, technologically advanced you are. But being familiar with this uh, gateway and portal ahead of time is good. And the other thing is make sure you have all your sites entered into EMERS ahead of time. So um, they're backed up. They were backed up. I don't know how things are now, but we got all of our sites entered a few years ago. Um, we've continued to keep that up to date. But if you don't have your sites entered in now um, or at the time of an outbreak, um, they're going to be so busy, it's going to, I don't know how you would ever get your sites entered at that time. So get those premise, premise IDs all entered in through EMERS so they have all that information in there ahead of time. It'll make your life a lot simpler uh, when it does come to that time where you need to use it, if you ever need to use it. Or in my case, might just be castrating cats. So um, I think that's about all I got. I think the, just the main points is that first 72 hours is critical. Uh, making sure you're prepared to identify any gaps. Um, in your system, you can get all the information that you need to the state timely. I think the more organized that information is and complete it is, the better chance you're going to have getting sites out of quarantine uh, to continue your business. Um, good communication plan ahead of time, thinking about the things that you need to communicate. Uh, really focusing on uh, developing a strategy, whether it's like we did with our query or what, or a call uh, calling tree in your system to get all that information very quickly. Um, being prepared to set up sites with those enhanced biosecurity plans. Um, having strategies for your farms to hold animals for more than 72 hours, maybe up to two weeks. Um, be prepared to get all the diagnostics collected and then um, be prepared to be able to have, have all your sites and emers and be, be able to do all the permitting. Um, I think when you think about how overwhelming a foreign animal disease is going to be, if you're trying to scramble and get all this stuff figured out after the fact, it's going to be that much tougher. Um, I think as much of this stuff on this list as you can be prepared for ahead of time, you're going to have most your I's dotted and T's crossed and be able to get, get things going in that, after that first 72 hours so it doesn't turn into two or three weeks. Uh, that's what I got. If you guys have any questions, I probably have a little bit of time. Not sure.
through this, have you changed any of your volumes that you try to maintain an inventory, be it like semen or feeding, on your sites? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, as we went through this, have we done some things changing kind of the supply chain so it's a little less just in time? Um, no, we, so we have not increased like the amount of volume or of semen that we keep on site. We don't have um, our own feed mills. We work all with toll mills, and we haven't added like bin storage. Um, obviously, we usually try to keep we have um, try to we have tandem bins, and we try to keep everything as full as possible. But you know, wouldn't say we don't have any feed outage events for sure. We have our fair share of problems with that. But um, so like things like feed and semen, we haven't changed um, like the ability to store more on site or maintain that longer. Ray. With your exercise, was there any involvement with county emergency uh, planning or county law enforcement when you did your exercise or what did you identify that might be able to make that work better as far as traffic going by, feed delivery, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the one in September, um, we didn't have anybody out at our sites. But we had we were um, down in Des Moines at or at Johnston at the headquarters there where they kind of have their emergency response command center for the state, and they did have some people that were representatives from like DNR emergency county emergency response people, and so we had some discussions with them around some of those things. But we never actually had them out on any sites. But I think it's important to know that they're going to be critical contact people for you in these events in terms of planning traffic and uh, sometimes even resources that they may have to help you as well. All right, thank you.